Human emotions. It's what makes us connect to a story and ironically, it's what most of us artists struggle with the most, capturing that spark. In illustration, we get to pause time, frame a moment, tweak it until it feels just right. Because it's still no surprises and no sudden movement. But the moment you try to add motion, everything changes. It's a whole different game. It demands more. It throws a mountain of tools your way, all useful, most confusing. It's like being handed an airplane and told to fly. Sounds impossible. But if there's one thing artists are great at, it's jumping into the deep end of a pool and figuring things out. So sharpen your pens. Let's get into the messy, strange, surprisingly rewarding process of bringing a 3D character to life without losing your mind. Starting this kind of project is rarely smooth and will be plastered with problems. But you'll learn faster by falling flat on your face than by waiting to feel ready. That said, you can save yourself a few headaches by prepping right. Call it a blueprint for failing smarter. Most of the time, I still think in 2D. Yes, over time I've picked up a few tricks in 3D here and there, but my brain defaults to flat colors and lines. Not necessarily what you want if you work with 3D tools. So I always begin with a concept on my iPad or in my sketchbook. Nothing hyper-precise, just enough to know what I'm aiming for. General shape, vibe, clothing, body language. For this project, I wanted a 90s-inspired character. Relaxed, not forced. Baggy clothes, a bit of attitude. Details like tattoos, a cap, maybe an earring, glasses. Stuff that draws focus to the face and tells you something about the character without over-explaining. I usually do a few iterations on things like the polo shirt or tattoos. Options are helpful, especially when working with clients. It stops you from marrying the first idea that pops into your head, which is rarely the best one. Think of the concept phase like letting fruit ripen. Give it time, let it evolve. Having the right tools for such a project matters, but knowing how to use them, that's even more important. And sometimes the right tools are just the ones you can afford. Most of us aren't trying to spend a small fortune on subscriptions. And that's okay, because limitations force creativity. So here's my low-budget toolkit and their price tag. Procreate for drawing on textures, Forger for sculpting, Pixamo for rigging, and Blender for everything else. Nothing fancy, but it gets the job done and gives you a good starting point to create a 3D character. If anything, these limitations push you to get better at problem solving. That's more valuable than having all the buttons in the world. Here comes the part I usually avoid. Sculpting. It intimidates me to the bone. Always a struggle, so I try to find shortcuts to get the result I want until I feel ready to tackle this challenge fully. I load up Forger and grab a base male body to start from. Could I model a full figure from scratch? Maybe with enough patience, but that's its own discipline, one that deserves real time and focus. For now though, I just need a solid foundation. From there, I adjust the face, jawline, nose, cheekbones, eyebrows. Move things around until it roughly resembles the sketch. Then I simplify parts of the mesh, strip out all the unnecessary details, which later gets painted back in with the texture, bringing out the juicy 2D look I strive for. Now, about the body. I don't go too deep since the baggy clothes will cover most of it. I just make sure the silhouette under the fabric has some stylized definition for when the cloth simulation kicks in. This approach is limited though. If you're building a character with a different body type or gender, plan to spend more time on the adjustments or you have to import another base mesh to start with. Fortress preset models options are limited after all, so grabbing a model from a marketplace like Turbo Squid can help a lot. Once the sculpting's locked in, I run the generate automatic UVs function, export the model to Procreate and jump into a little bit of UV painting. Finally back in my comfort zone, Procreate's UV painting tool is functional, but rough around the edges. It's more precise than painting on a flat unwrapped UV map, but comes with some weird limitations. The max texture resolution is low and can't be adjusted. No symmetry options, brush size scales with the zoom level? Still, for stylized characters, it works for me just good enough. And if I need more details, I can later upscale the flat UV map and add more brush strokes. Enough of technicalities. I lay down the base colors, then go in with bolder strokes for definition. Color shifts add depth. Going from big to medium to small shapes is key. And to run it off, a few black lines bring out their 2D feel. Then, when I'm done, I export the painted model with the texture, send everything to my Mac and I'll blend it for the next step. Clothing. A 
quick interlude. In a perfect world, this process would be smooth as butter. But of course, Procreate likes to mess with meshes. A quick fix? Importing the model from Forge into Blender and only apply the texture to VMap from Procreate instead of using the textured model from it. A slight hassle. I chalk it up to using tools in the ways they weren't really built to be used. Just another flavor in the chaotic recipe of this character I'm cooking. Time to dress this guy. I use my concept art and some real-world photo references from Pinterest. Nothing too wild, just basic cut for the shirt and pants. We do not have the time and capacity to create haute couture. Clothing in Blender can be straightforward if your model simple from the start. I start with the pants. I extrude and cut basic shapes around the body using a mirror modifier and tweak the mesh until it looks right. Once I'm happy, I apply the mirror modifier and then add some subdivision surface modifier to give the mesh enough density for the simulation to work properly. Next, I apply a cloth modifier to the pants and a collision modifier to the body. Adjust the settings, weight, stiffness, self collision, assign a vertex group to avoid the pants sagging into oblivion. Sim it and repeat until it behaves. Optional but helpful, the Simply Cloth Blender add-on for $36 makes the sim life easier with presets and many extra tools that are easy to understand and work smoother. When the simulation feels solid, I apply it, fix the details with the Sculpt tool and finally unwrap the UV maps with the help of marked edge seams. Lastly, I import the model as an OBJ to procreate for another round of UV painting. But wait, you might wonder, why not just wait and do all the UV painting at the end once everything's modeled and ready? Well, because Procreate and multiple meshes are not exactly best friends. It usually freaks out when you try to paint on separate objects. It's much happier when everything's joined into one nice tidy model. Unnecessarily complicated? Oh yeah, absolutely, but hey, we adapt. Alright. Clothing, done. UV painting, done. Now let's give this guy some bones. So, rigging from scratch, that's a new rabbit hole I am not diving in today. Instead, I take another shortcut. I use Miximo. It's free, has an auto rigger and comes with a bunch of animation presets. Most of them slightly cursed, but usable for tests or white shots. To use it, I export the model as FBX from Blender. Not OBJ, unless you crave chaos. Upload it to Miximo, place the markers, enjoy the loading screen and then you get your free janky rig. Easy. Only downside, FBX does not store material data, so we have to fix that later. I scroll through some presets, have a good laugh at some of the cursed ones and in the end, settle on the classic T-pose, just what I need. Then I hit download and beam everything straight back into Blender like it's returning from a slightly awkward vacation. Now I've got full control of the body, limbs, joints, the whole puppet show. But the baggy cloths, they absolutely love chaos. The auto rigger thinks the shirt is the skin and suddenly your character looks like they got into a fight with Blender's physics engine. So here's the hack. You just adjust some of the automatic generated weight maps and if anything is still poking through, delete the skin mesh underneath. We don't need it anymore anyway. Gun, never happened. Definitely not the industry standard, but hey, it works and it keeps the vibe moving. Let's give this character a face, or more specifically, expressions. Rather than adding bones to animate facial features, painful, I use shape keys in Blender. Think of them as snapshots of the mesh in different emotional states. Happy, sad, angry, use sculpt or edit each one, then blend between them with sliders. Sounds complicated? Don't worry, you will understand once you see it. To build an expression, I add a shape key for a neutral state of the face. Then I dissect the face in areas, eyes, nose, mouth. Each area and expression gets their own shape key. Go into edit sculpt mode, slide the value to 1, adjust the parts I want, mouth, corners, brows, etc. I repeat this for all expressions I need. The more you create, the more options you have to combine and animate. But I always make sure that I only affect one area per shape key, otherwise you'll end up with a chaotic mess of expressions that look more like a broken emoji than a real face. If I mess up a shape key, no worries, I can always go back in and move the mesh around. After all, this process is non-destructive. This workflow is flexible, intuitive and super useful for stylized characters. You can exaggerate in ways normal rigs can't. And if you are nifty with coding, you can even make extra control panels with scripts to make control faster and easier. Anyway, now with everything set in place, I can do funny stuff like this. Crazy, right? With bones in our hands and expressions in the bag, let's make it feel real. 
use references. Seriously, a mirror, movie clips, TikTok dances, whatever helps you understand how emotions show up on the body and face. This will make your life easier, trust me. In Blender, set keyframes for big movements first, your key poses. These poses act as the anchor point of animation, showing the extreme or significant moments in the character's action. Then I add in-betweens were needed. For facial animation, tweak the shape key sliders based on expression, intensity and timing. Depending on the type of shot, you might need to spend more time on different paths. Close above the face, crank up the fine-tuning of the facial animation and ignore the legs. For establishing shots, I don't really need to show individual hairs wiggle. That said, stylist animations often benefit from exaggeration. Push it further than you think, especially if you want that 2D feel in 3D space. And while doing so, always have the 12 animation principles in the back of your head. A great example of how all this can come together, K-Pop Demon Hunters. Seriously, go watch it, the expression's next level. You'll get exactly what I mean once you see those faces move. Hours passed, unholy amounts of coffee were consumed, and the result? A quirky little reaction to a phone ringing off screen. Was it worth it? Absolutely! I'm almost there. My character is ready to shine. But first, I had to build a little scene around him. Nothing fancy, just a backdrop to help sell the vibe. And to push the animation style a bit further, I added a step interpolation modifier to my keyframes with step size 2. Basically, it's me telling Blender, yo, move only on every second frame. And suddenly, it feels like the character's more 2D. Snappy, a little janky, but full of charm. The end result with this process might feel a bit messy or offbeat. That's okay, that's kind of the point. This isn't about making pixel level polish. It's about learning a process that lets your 2D characters walk, talk and live in 3D. And once you've gone through it once, you'll know which parts to double down on next time. And which ones to simplify. So, whether your character comes out goofy, weird or strangely charming, you made it move and you made it speak. So, that's a win.